My name's Sue Adams and I've been a West Ham fan 65 years. In my consciousness, I've always been aware of West Ham. My dad was a big West Ham fan. And one day, he took me to a game. I must have been five or six. I don't know why he took me. Um, and we went, and I know we were in the chicken run. I have no idea who we played. They were in blue, I remember that. But the atmosphere just blew my socks off. I was tiny, but the men at the front, I said, bring her here. And I sat on the wall with people I didn't know and they looked after me. Dad went somewhere. And he came at half time and went and disappeared again, wherever he was. Um, but the noise, if I close my eyes now, I can see the band, I can smell the ground. And that was it, I was just fell in love. So we had some real adventures over there. Um, I think it was Spurs. So I went with my friend and it was packed, absolutely rammed. And we used to go after hockey. We used to play hockey in the morning, rush to her dad's furniture shop. He had a furniture shop on the Barking Road. And his claim to four is that Bobby Moore slept in his bed. He told him his bed. Um, and we got in and we used to like to stand in front of a barrier so that if people went forward, they stopped behind us because we thought we, we were just going to be bowled over. We, couldn't, we could hardly see. And she said to me, just follow my lead. She suddenly said, I think I'm going to faint. I think I'm going to faint. Of course, the men around, typical East End men, <gasps> come on, darling, come on, picked her up, sort of surfed her over the top. Saying, come on, come with us, come with us. Went down the front. Oh, St John's love it, didn't they? You know, they've got something to do. Took her out. Come on. And we sat on the side of the pitch for the rest of the match. And we won. <laughs> <laughs> it's things like that that I remember. N not necessarily scores mm. and things. Because as I say, I can remember so many more vic uh, losses and victories that I perhaps just eradicate that, isn't it? Because there's usually something quite nice that happens at a game. And the fans were mixed. There was no segregation. This was the 60s. And there were rules in that we were allowed to slag, sorry, slag off our players as much as we like. You couldn't slag off theirs and they couldn't do the same to you but it was perfectly okay to discuss what was going on cheer your goals boo bad fouls and or cheer bad fouls depending on which way they were going and there was never any problem and I just like the fact that you were there to enjoy a game of football you wanted your side to win but it wasn't the be all and end all it was a social occasion with other people from different parts of the country and everything. And it was only really in the 70s when all the bother started, where they had to start segregating. Mm. And I think football really, really lost something. We went once to Chelsea and we were in the Chelsea friends and family area. When we went in and they were looking at us, they said, okay, hands up, we're West Ham. If we happen to score, I'll try not to cheer, but if I do, just, you know. And they went, oh, that's all right. And then all the banter started. And, and that just took me back again. Because it was lovely, because it wasn't personal. It wasn't, it was just good old-fashioned banter. Mm. And so that was lovely. <laughs> For me, the players that epitomised West Ham, well, obviously Billy Bonds. He just epitomised it. You know, people really seem to respect him. He epitomises everything I think is important in life. You work hard. You do your absolute best all the time. 
sometimes your absolute best is not good enough, but that's no excuse to stop. You just keep trying and you just keep giving your best. Um, he seemed to have really good leadership skills. I like the, the loyal players, the players who, I would like to say they show you that they care about who they're playing for. Mm. I love Mark Noble. Again, not flashy, but just works hard, you know, gives everything he has every game. And you could see sometimes he seems to get quite frustrated with himself because he knows he's not playing as well as he can play. But he doesn't hide, he never hides. And that, I like that in a player, you know, it's too easy to disappear on a football pitch. And he never disappears. I went to the 80 Cup final. Got a ticket very late, sat next to Alvin Martin's auntie and uncle. I had a lovely time with Alvin's auntie and uncle. They fed me because they bought so much food. I don't know what they thought was in London, but they didn't think there was food, obviously. Um, and of course, Trevor scored. Oh, Devonshire's round the back. Oh, right across, it's free. Driven in, and is it a goal? It is. Held on, second division team, you know, wonderful, wonderful afternoon. And I remember going back to Barking. I mean, the train going, it had just been a whole chant. You know, we are the Clout and Blue Army, Clout and Blue Army. Coming back, it was just manic. And we went to the Brit in Barking, and it was, I mean, people were dancing, people were hanging out of the windows, and then very early the next day, not feeling that good, obviously went to the parade. And uh, it's just the joy it brings. And I'm sure it's the same for every team. But when you don't do it very often, you know, it, you know Arsenal, what, 14 times now? Well, if it's the 14th time you've been to the parade, I can't believe it's as exciting as the first time you go to the parade. It was so busy. But everybody was mindful of each other. Um, so it was lovely. I loved it when Trevor Brooking came to talk to any old irons and he said that when we were relegated, the England man, I think it was Ron Greenwood at the time, phoned him up and said, you don't have to leave the club, you will still be considered. Well, I don't think today, if you're in the championship, you would be considered for England. And so, you know, you lose your best, you lose half the players that could get you back, you lose. Yeah. And uh, so it was, it was such a joyous day. because he was so naughty. <laughs> I mean, I would have hated to have taught him, but oh, he was so naughty. But some of the things he could do, he was so outrageous. And you just thought, oh, you know. And I think we've become a bit blasé in the Premier League in that there's quite a few players who can do absolutely mind-boggling things. Well, we hadn't seen that sort of mind-boggling skill. We'd had very free-flowing footballs like Brooking and Devonshire and people like that. But he was the first, for me, of a, of a West Ham player that could do that. I thought my life was full. But I think the one thing about any old Irons is the fact that nobody seems to have any side. 
Nobody seems to be trying to prove themselves in any way. People are just there because of one thing, they love West Ham United. I have made so many new friends. As we've grown, it's become more joyous and more difficult because you've got more people that you have to try and keep happy. But because we've got a lot more people, we're finding more and more players have heard about us and are therefore, they know vaguely what they're coming along to. Um, and I think it's, what I like is you see people who come in and who have obviously been quite lonely and they've been quite isolated and they've perhaps lost some of their social skills through lack of use, not because they haven't got them, feel comfortable and you can see them blossom and they become different people and that's very satisfying. I suppose West Ham in the last few years has given me an outlet for who I am. And I've been able to be useful being who I am. So that gives me great joy. <music> to me, West Ham means my dad. Our, our whole family, friendship, great highs, deep lows, frustration, joy, and a need to support them. And I don't know where that need comes from, but it is a need to support them. They're just there in my life. Sorry, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. It just means that much. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm fine. I feel silly now. <laughs>